David, thank you very much for coming, and I look forward to your talk. Well, thank you very much. I, uh, it's a great honor to be here. Um, John Hansborough is a great friend of mine, and uh, we had a lot of conversations together. The burn world's a very small world. We know everyone all over the country, and uh, he was incredibly good researcher, and Wendy, his wife, was also part of the team. Um, and I got to know through the skin substitutes, which has come a long way, and as uh, Bruce said, it's a um, problem now because companies don't want to do much with it. Um, so I'm going to talk about response to injury, some concepts, and start off pretty basic. He asked me to talk about research, so these are some of the interests I have. I'm kind of interested, why do you have this response to injury? Is it good to have the response to injury or not? Um, and one thing I see very often is I have two children, same burn, they could be brother and sister or brother and brother, same injury, one does really well, one does really poorly, and why does that occur? Um, why does the timing of injury occur? Why do they get septic at this time or that time? So, and can we really affect the response to injury? So that's what I'm going to talk about. And kind of what I'd like to do is start with very simple concepts and go on to kind of bizarre stuff um, and stuff that we're doing. So I'll give you the visual, which is how I think about the body and the response to injury, some concepts, and then go on to genes, polymorphisms, and how they might affect things, going to looking at the glucocorticoid receptor. And then some really bizarre things that we're starting to look at in the lab, and uh, uh, we'll go from there. So if you look at us, we're, we're a fortress. We are surrounded by a wall, which is our skin. Um, that keeps everything out. That's how we protect our bodies. We have citizens, our organs. They do their job. Um, and then we have sentinels that go around and look for signs of injury. And then we have soldiers, our inflammatory cells, and construction workers. And that's how we're made. And so, you know, your, your barrier, the wall, you lose that, all these invaders can pour in. And that's what happens with our burns. The invaders pour in, and you have to fight the war to keep them out. Um, the epidermis is what is the barrier. The dermis, all it is, is gives you the strength of that wall. And then, um, you know, inflammation are the soldiers that are there to fight and keep the bad guys out. And then you actually do have cells. They're about 10 to 50 percent of the cells in most tissues. The resident macrophages, they're the ones that detect the damage. They sound the sirens and say there's damage going on here. Um, if you cannot make a new wall, the epithelial barrier, the body says we'll do the best we can and lay down collagen. The construction workers, the fibroblasts, will lay down collagen, blood vessels, and you get that granulation tissue. And it's not as good as the original, but it helps. And the other thing they do is that the construction workers try to close the wall. So they pull together the wall to try to close it. And these are the problems we have with burns, is that these attempt to close the wall leads to the scarring, the hypertrophic scarring. That's kind of the visual of what, what happens in response to injury. Now, the concept, there was a great article in Nature last year um, by this Ruslan Metzidoff. I probably said it wrong, but it's a great way to think about how we respond to injury. So I'll go over that a little bit. And the definition here is it, inflammation is an adaptive response to restoring hemostasis in response to some form of stress. Now, it doesn't mean you have to have the 80% burn. It could be the splinter. It also can be mild stress. And, he really actually looks at it, this is also what happens, mild stressors occur when you have diabetes, for instance. And so a lot of these concepts work. And uh, um, you can have different responses to the injury. You can have uh, trauma with a severe insult. You can have mild injuries, just hypoxia, hyperglycemia, leading to the diabetic response. And a mild response just handled by the local cells. So what's the outcome? Either you can survive, you can do well, you heal the wounds, or you can have a stalemate. You can have chronic inflammation. Diabetes, for instance, is a stalemate. We're kind of compromising. We're not quite back to normal. You can get a scar which isn't quite back to normal, or you can fail. So that's the conflict we're, we're playing every day. Um, and so you can break inflammation into four factors. There's the inducers. Those are the signals that cause the signs that you're injured, the sensors, those are the receptors that we have to detect that there's injury. 
and then the mediators that help us respond, and then the effectors are the cells. In an example here, and you can see that uh, the classic, you guys all know, you get LPS, that's the inducer, that's from our bacteria, and then you get TLR receptors, and then the mediators are, are cytokines, and uh, then we have the effectors. But it's not only just for infection, but it, allergens have a similar response, collagen has a similar response. So these are all things, ways to think about it. So if one example of inducers and sensors, and a lot of research here, I've done some research, is we have developed receptors for these products of bacteria, or we could detect RNA or DNA in its wrong place. And we know the sensors, the pathogen recognition receptors, like the toll-like receptors. And I have a very busy slide because now we know there's like around 10 in cells and there's multiple pathways, but I won't get into that because it'll bore you. Um, we have had similar studies. Um, we've looked at whether TLR4 changes or CD14. CD14 is the protein that actually binds the LPS lip lipos polysaccharide binding protein combination. And we did a bunch of studies to see, well, if you knock out CD14, you can do that in mice, or if you have mutant um, TLR4 mice that don't respond to uh, LPS, um, do you ever change? And this is the model we use for all of our studies. It's basically a burn model with uh, about 18% burns, and these animals do have a response. Um, here we've shown in studies in the past that you get acute phase proteins turned on both in wild type animals. And we looked at some of these others, now SAA and SAP acute phase proteins are like C-reactive proteins, same kind of thing, but in a mouse. And we did find there were differences whether you had CD14 knocked out or not. So these are some of the examples we looked at. Same kind of thing with uh, if you knock out TLR4 or use a mutant TLR4 animals, that there is a difference if you don't have these signalings in response to injury. That's kind of interesting, and we showed that there's changes in the uh, amounts of different kinds of receptors. We look for by PCR, TLR9, and we've actually done some of the real-time PCR. So yeah, there are differences, which is interesting, but I won't really focus on that much because a lot of people are doing that. Um, other areas we've looked at include, or others have looked at, what are the other inducers? Now, bacteria, for instance, has toxins that causes bad things like tetanus toxin, Botox. I guess it does some good things too. Um, and uh, we have receptors for all these. And there are different receptors um, depending on the different um, inducers for bacteria. And so we know that bacteria cause bad things. But they're also, what about allergens, irritants? These have receptors too that causes a response. And people have whole careers looking at what the receptors are for these. Um, and some of these things like NALP3 and flamazone is a sensor for foreign bodies and the cells will combine and try to wrap around a foreign body if they can't phagocytize it. So that's some of it. But the other thing is that we have endogenous um, inducers of inflammation. So you don't have to be hit from the outside. You can have damage to the inside. And one of the common themes is that our body is car... car yeah, I can say it compartmentalized so that uh, if one tissue is all of a sudden exposed to another tissue, you'll get an inflammatory response. So tissue in the wrong place causes a response. For example, if you destroy a cell, all the products inside the cell, like ATP, potassium, these things are sensed by their actually receptors for pretty much everything, saying, all right, there's damage inside, let's have a response, let's start the healing process. We know for burns in particular that the epithelium and the mesenchymal cells are normally separated by that basement membrane. You destroy that, you get a change in the response to injury. Um, simply the vascular endothelium, you lose that, you get damage to it, you turn on that whole process of clotting and the clotting is involved in the inflammatory response. Rislin uh, talked about the Hegeman factor being a big sensor for vascular damage starting all these cascades. So damage inside the blood vessel will really will induce sensors that go on and cause these mediations to change response to injury. Um, the chronic inflammatory conditions are also endogenous um, changes that 
can lead to inflammation. He talked about things like gout, ages, advanced glycation end products. That happens in response to hyperglycemia. You produce these, end gly these uh, advanced glycation end products. They're actually <coughs> detected by receptors that cause an inflammatory response, which lead to the chronic changes due to diabetes. Um, so it, it can even be to the point that if your cell is stressed that it cannot fold your proteins correctly inside the endothelium, in the endothelial retic endoplasmic reticulum, that uh, you have receptors inside the cell say, we cannot go on and make the proteins correctly, so it will affect the cells and change the response of the cell. So even the stress that causes the cell to be unable to make proteins correctly will lead to an inflammatory response. And we know we have lots of receptors inside, like the steroid hormone receptors. We'll talk about that. We actually have receptors inside the nucleus for things like excessive cholesterol. And the PPRs, the peroxisome proliferator activated receptors, are an example of another sensor that is involved in an inflammatory response, which I won't get into. Now, um, they cause this response in an the mediators that are there are multiple, seven groups of them. So, and you guys know all these, the vasoactive means, histamine, <coughs> substance P, the complement proteins, all these are the mediators that cause the body to respond to that stress. Um, and you think about it, we talk about the high-end response, but you can have mild response. You don't have to have massive inflammation every time you have a little bump on your heel or something. A lot of times you get uh, very mild stress, and so how does the body respond to it? Well, the local cells take care of it. When you have a bigger stress, they can't handle the stress itself, so they call in the inflammatory cells, so that causes a little redness around your wound. And if you get to a larger stress, then you need to have a whole body response, and that's how I respond to that injury. Um, if you really come down to think about it, a cell can have four states. It can be basal state, quiescent, everything's good, or it can be stressed. And when it's stressed, it has to respond and try to do something to get through that stress. If it gets stressed to a point that it just says, I'm damaged so badly, it undergoes apoptosis. And if it gets to an even greater stress, it goes on and dies. And it turns out that uh, we, there are actually receptors and signals inside all cells that regulate the process, even necrosis has receptors that says damage is so bad, it tells that cell to go on and die. So it's incredible the, the control that the cells have in response to injury. Now, as I stated earlier, the cells that monitor for signs of, uh, of damage are the resident macrophages. There's tons of them. Um, and the response, the inflammatory cells that cause, help us respond to injury, the TNFs, whatever, um, does cause a lot of the damage that occurs in major injury. And once you get a large burn, for instance, that system, the whole system, the whole body, has to respond in order to try to get through that injury. So the way I like to describe it is that when you get above a threshold, the uh, inflammatory cells are released in their cytokines. They get to be so much that they become systemic. They get absorbed into the body. They go through the system, they go to the lungs, they go to the brain. The brain detects them and it says, oh my gosh, there's damage in sectors 15 through 42. We better help the body respond. In response to that, the brain goes to the hypothalamus, the hypothalamus goes to the adrenal, the adrenal releases catecholamines, you get that hypermetabolic response, you get the release of uh, uh, corticosteroids, and you get that hypermetabolic response that we see after our, our major injuries. How do you shut that process off? Well, if you have a splinter causing an inflammatory response, you pull the splinter out. And as uh, was mentioned earlier, once you have a massive burn, the idea to get rid of that inflammatory process, you take the patient to the burn OR, you cut off the burn, you cover them with as much skin as you can to try to shut off that inflammatory process. So how do we turn off the process? How do we do it? What are the things that turn off the process? And that's one thing we're going to look at. Um, and this is one thing we're looking at our labs. 
Um, there's different forms of regulation, and we'll get into that in a little bit. Um, there are many mechanisms, anti-inflammatory cytokines, the balance of Th1, Th2 cells, um, and then there's hormonal controls. And so what I'm going to talk about, what our research is about, is uh, looking at some of the glucocorticoid response. Um, we know cortisol is one of the key mediators of the inflammatory response, and we'll talk about some of our research in that. Um, the key of our lab is to look at polymorphisms in response to injury, and it's one of the key things we're looking at, and that glucocorticoid receptor, we have a receptor and it has multiple variations. Um, and let me talk about how that happened. Now, if you look at the glucocorticoid receptor, it's bound um, in the serum, and it has to be released from the bound form, it goes into the cell. It actually goes into and binds to a uh, glucocorticoid receptor, and from there it has to form a dimer, and then it goes on and goes into binding to the DNA, and that causes the anti-inflammatory response we know all about. Um, it's even more complicated. It goes to the receptors, but the, if it doesn't dimerize, it can directly inhibit uh, NF-kappa B, and there's multiple other effects that it has. So we uh, wanted to look at how it responds to steroids, and this is, uh, we did some of these studies early on, and we showed that you have in the model, again, no burn, burn, collect tissues, and this was in uh, lungs after burn injury. We found the glucocorticoid receptor was down-regulated early on after injury. And we found the same thing with the uh, protein. It was down-regulated. So maybe in response to injury, you have less receptors, so you don't respond as well. That's kind of interesting. Um, and we did a lot of studies with these knockout animals to see if there's differences, and we found differences, no decreased expression with the K CD14 knockout <coughs> animals. Um, Kehoe Cho, who's a PhD who, in my lab, very observant guy, so it's, well, you know, Look at this blot. It's a little bit lower than this one. So, you know, little observations like that can make a big difference. Um, so what does he do? He, he goes and clones it, you know, and he clones both, both of these blots. And this is the wild-type animal. This is the knockout. And what we found was that there's differences in the size because there's differences in the gene structure. And I'm, I know you can't see it here, but there's an area in the glucocorticoid receptor which is called the poly-Q region, and it's true for all um, receptors like the androgen receptor, estrogen receptor, and there's parts of them that have a poly-Q region, and it's a repeats of CAGs, and they vary, um, and we found that the wild type had 17 and the knockouts had only eight of these, and um, find that interesting. And if you look at antigen receptor, where there's poly-Q variations, diseases result from it. Because if you have variation, a very long poly-Q in adults, um, you get diseases. It's related to Huntington's Korea, for instance. So we said, well, why don't we clone these? And we used a model, I won't get into it too much, where we actually transfected these genes into a luciferase uh, reporter. And you can actually do the luciferase study. And this is what the amount of activity for a, the wild type, and if you put it with a shorter, just these poly-Q regions, markedly decreased function. So I think, well, wow, maybe this is a reason why some people have a profound response to injury, some people have a lesser response. And what we did was we actually varied the number of these poly-Qs in, uh, in some of these glucocorticoid receptors and again, this is what the wild type is. It looks like the wild type guys have figured out what's the best response. Um, and if you change that number, and these are actually numbers of mice we actually took. We asked Jackson Laboratories, give us some cDNA of all the different strains of mice. And we found there's a huge variation. And we found that there's a huge variation in response to glucocorticoid receptor. Um, and if you know, if you do studies with mice, if you look at C57 black versus the bowel of Cs, some of these mice, you can stomp on them, kick them, nothing happens to them, and some you can just blow on them and they drop dead. And so it explains like little simple variations in their uh, structure can cause a profound difference in their response to injury. 
Um, okay, well, that's kind of interesting. So we said, well, what about people? We've seen mice, it makes a huge difference. Is there a variation in, in people? So we actually uh, used the universal donor, which is anyone we could find in the lab. We drew blood from people. Um, and we want to look at, is there variations in what people have in a glucocorticoid receptor? Now, we know that there are differences in response to injury or just other diseases. There's some people with asthma who respond, some who don't. And actually, this is work for one of the residents in my lab. 10% um, of children with nephrotic syndrome don't respond to steroids. Um, about 1 in 1,000, there's a bunch of kids who, you know, they always take in steroids for their asthma. There's a bunch who don't respond. And same is true for inflammatory bowel disease. These people don't respond. Why is that the case? So that's what we want to look at, you know, why are there differences in response um, in, does this explain it? So if you look at the structure of the human glucocorticoid receptor, there's nine um, exons. The first one and a quarter exons actually don't produce the protein. Um, and then you get these different parts of the uh, receptor. Um, the nine alpha, nine beta is actually interesting. There's alternate splicing you can go with. Um, if you produce the nine alpha, the alpha version, you get a normal receptor. If you produce the beta version, you have a decoy that doesn't respond. Um, so we have that already in our system. Um, and these are just examples of there's different forms, sort of alpha and beta. Alpha is the one that's actually active. Um, so we drew blood. We did RNA isolation, genomic DNA isolation, and we tested people in the same way we tested it for, for the mice. And you can see, if you just, this is one of the early ones, that yeah, indeed, people have marked variations in the structure of their glucocorticoid receptor. And this is a summary of 99 subjects. These are normal people, and uh, 25 subjects had early termination, which made them shorter. Um, 96 subjects had point mutation. So we all are different in our glucocorticoid receptor. You know, this is just one receptor. Um, they had only documented in the NCBI database, only 11, so we're finding a lot more. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about those. Now, just for background, if you look at how we, uh, the first number here is the number of the subject, and then to actually do this, we had to do PCR for section 2 to 3, and then break it up and do 3 through 9 to get the, uh, the variations. Um, so that's how we've done these numbers. Um, and these are just pictures of some of them. These are examples of point mutations that would lead to smaller proteins. Um, and these are from people. Now, some of these are heterozygous, so it's hard to know is there functional significance to it or not. And we're going to continue to look at that. We did the transfection studies. And indeed, if you transfect these human versions into the model, there is marked decrease in activity compared to the standard, this is the one we find in the, as a reference in the world. Um, and notice these numbers, about 5,000, because the next one I'm going to show you is even more interesting, because we did find um, one that had three point mutations. And I'll get into what, why that's important. And this, again, this is the standard version that you find as a reference. Um, and we've looked at some variations of that. I'll just get into this. And what we found is this is the one at 5,000. This is what we find as a reference, but we actually have now found s some receptors that lead to a hyper response to steroids. So these people, instead of having a down regulation in response to steroids, have a hyper response. Here is like almost, well, we're almost six times the, the normal response. So we got some people who have receptors that can lead to a, a, a decreased response, some that lead to a massive response. Um, and actually, Kelly in our lab tried to figure out if you take out, if you try to add different point mutations, so you just say, all right, we'll look at this one, we'll add it in, this one, we'll add it in, and the different combinations to see did you need all three of these versions. And what you found was this is the hyper responder. If you have one point mutation from this one, it decreased the activity. Um, so it seems like these three point mutations optimize the ability to respond to a glucocorticoid receptor. So 
this set of studies, that's one of the areas we're looking at, is that, yeah, polymorphisms can make a huge difference in response. We've just looked at, really, um, a normal response. We actually haven't stimulated them with different kinds of, uh, of uh, corticosteroids. Now, if you, if you know a little bit about glucocorticoids, mice actually don't even use cortisol. They use corticosterone. And maybe why they use corticosterone is because they actually have a receptor that responds better to that, um, that hormone compared to cortisol. Um, we actually have found a few people who have a glucocorticoid receptor that is identical to the mouse now. So we're going to see if they respond to corticosterone. And we're going to start looking at whether uh, normal people in response to injuries have these similar kinds of different responses. And so this might be a way to look at, all right, do you have non-responders? Can you find out a non-responder by looking at the receptor? And don't bother to give them steroids and treat them with something else if they have asthma or nephrotic syndrome. Um, and if you have a hyperactive, do you need less steroid to have them respond better? Um, so we're going to try to look at more people, and we're going to actually look at some of our patients to see how they respond to injury, see if there's a difference. Um, you know, we've also looked at some of the earlier, can you look at how uh, transcription start sites go on? And so this brings me to another area we're starting to look at. Um, we're going to get into the more bar bizarre things as we finish up. Now, epigenetics, and Dr. Baird was telling me he's getting into this too, because it turns out the gene, gene only does part of the work, okay? And Men Mendel was lucky because some of his peas responded, but we don't all work our genes don't turn on, turn off all the time. They're not always responding. Most of our genes aren't active. So epigenetics is uh, all meiotically and mitotically heritable changes in gene expression that are not coded by the DNA itself. So our DNA sequences aren't the only thing that have us respond to injury. Um, so I'll go into that a little bit. So what are the things that do it? You know, DNA methylation, when you methylize a part of the, the gene, it shuts it off, so you can't get to it. So that's one way we regulate it. Um, and there's a lot of stuff here I want to get into. Um, we don't have to get the details of it, but you can actually start, we're just starting to do this. You can treat a gene, a, a PCR with sulfite, and it'll change the sequence from C to T, so you can actually determine which genes are active or which activation sites are active by comparison, comparing the PCR before and after sulfide treatment. So we're starting to look at those techniques. We haven't done too much of that yet. Um, there are other factors that are involved, and other people are doing these. You can, you know, the heterochromatin is the tightly wrapped around the histones, whereas the euchromatin is the only one that's available for gene expression. How do you control that? There's different ways. Um, again, acetylation is one of the things, and people are really getting into this. We haven't looked at it as much, but you can regulate whether a gene is available by uh, its acetylation. You have uh, the histone acetylation enzymes that are involved. You can turn on and turn off a gene. And people are starting to look at, is that regulation a way to turn on a gene or not? Um, methylations, other things we can do. And the other thing is that a lot of our genes are no longer, they may be active, but they can be blocked by RNA that's produced by the genes. Um, so RNA can interfere and can be produced at a regular amount of time to lead to interfering with the gene function. Even though that gene's there and available, RNA can bind to that site, prevent it from being activated. And so a lot of the regulation, and there's all different kinds of uh, blocking RNA, MI, and these get really complicated, but I won't uh, get into that. But we have different ways to regulate our gene function. So I'll just uh, mention those. Um, and there's a lot of epigenetic control, the NF-kappa Bs, again, by some of these acetylation activations or inhibitors. Um, and glucocorticoids are involved in that also. I'm going to get even more bizarre here. It turns out, if you think of evolution, that, uh, again, genes passed on, they don't change at all. It turns out that there's a lot more regulation there's in, in what people used to call junk DNA, that the genes are a very small part of what regulates what we do. Um, and it turns out there's these things called transposable or mobile elements, 
in our DNA. And what they do is that they can, a piece of the DNA can disconnect and reconnect somewhere else. And that way influence what happens. Now it turns out that almost half of our genome is made up of these mobile elements. And if you look at, if you read science, and some of the stuff I have trouble because it's really complicated, but plants have 90% of what changes the color of the flower, for instance, is regulated by these transposable elements. Um, so they're very important, and one of the ways they're really controlled is by the RNA interference. So these things are jumping throughout our body, and that's, what, that's why as I get older, I get grayer hair, I get age spots and stuff like that, because th this stuff happens. So there are three types, and hang in there, because we'll just briefly go over them. And then I'll, the reason why I'm going over this is because we're starting to look at some of this stuff in response to injury. But there's DNA transposon, there's autonomous retrotransposons, and I mean, all you young guys out there, this is going to be what you're doing for research, because this is just starting out. Um, and then there's non-autonomous, and I'll just mention what they are. Um, DNA transposon um, is actually where DNA is actually cut out and pasted somewhere else, okay? Um, and this local hopping, it happens around the gene. And, you know, I was just reading a paper recently that, you know, the hypervariable region of your, uh, of your immunoglobulin is probably regulated in this kind of thing. That's why you have so much variation in your hypervariable region. And there's enzymes. They know all about the enzymes and what regulate these. Um, the retrotransposon, a retrotransposon is actually requires, you, you make the RNA, then it has to go through the same reverse transcription to DNA like a retrovirus, okay? You guys know HIV and all that stuff. Um, and then they go somewhere else. Um, and it turns out that these uh, are like retroviruses, um, but they're missing parts of their genes. Um, and I'll mention a little bit about retroviruses because that's one thing we're doing in the lab. But, you know, retroviruses, where you guys know HIV, they all have these three genes, pull, gag, and envelope gene. The envelope is what allows it to travel outside. Um, these retrotransposons <coughs> lack the envelope gene, but they're still in our genome, okay? Um, and it's probably from infections in the past. Now, I'll just mention now in Dodge's retrovirus, we'll talk about it in a little bit, but these retroviruses infect us. Now, if they infect you in your sex cells and you go to the ovary or the sperm, you pass that retrovirus to your child. And we have retroviruses throughout our genes that influence how we respond to injury. And we'll get into more about that. Um, the LTR, the LTR means long-term repeat. These retrotransposons now, they lack the envelope gene, but they still are, we are full of these retroviral remnants in our gene that probably influence how we respond to different things. And then there are these other ones. These are smaller. Um, they're called lines, long interspersed nu nucleotide elements. We have these enzymes that will allow these pieces of DNA to be inserted in other parts of the body um, and regulate um, genes. This is the non-autonomous, non-autonomous and autonomous means it has all the enzymes right there in its genes like a virus inside us. So you can influence yourself by these genes jumping around throughout our body. Um, the non-autonomous don't have all those, and these are examples, the, the signs. Okay. Now, if you look at our DNA, this is for human. This is the stuff we know that we're used to studying in medical school. And the signs, about 13% lines, 20%. And these retroviral elements, again, a huge part, 8% of our, our DNA is made up of this junk, okay? So what does that mean? Well, we can talk a little more about it. It turns out that if you look at um, when the meteor hit, you know, and wiped out the dinosaurs, um, these elements are turned on when we're stressed, okay? And if you look at the organisms, let's say you're a trilobite, you know, and you want to try to survive, all of a sudden the sun's gone, it's really cold, and you, these things are turned on. And in, in the species is a teleological thing is that in order to get through to evolve and not become extinct, we need some radical mutation and hope we're lucky that we mutate so we can survive this major stress. And it turns out these transposable mobile elements are really cranked up when you are stressed 
And so that may be why when we have these massive extinctions, some of the cells survive and go on and evolve. Which is kind of interesting uh, if you're really, in, I'm into fossils and stuff, but so this may help you survive, um, which brings me to an area that we're looking at, viruses, and how do viruses influence the response to injury, and we'll finish up on this. Um, we're actually looking at these retroviruses. Now, we know that you think about some of the cancers, a lot of the cancers are in response to viruses like cervical cancer. Now we have, we have vaccines for cervical cancer viruses, and so, do these viruses, are they involved in response to injury? And, and Kiho Cho is the PhD, basically he's the guy who runs the lab now. Um, he's a virologist and so he's very much interested in this and actually has uh, NIH funding to look at this retrovirus question. Um, and this just pictures, you know, the whole, our DNA, and we're, this is the histones we're wrapped in. And then if you look at it, there's retroviral elements throughout our genes. And, it's a picture of a retrovirus. So a retrovirus that has a endogenous retrovirus is colonized into the germline and it's passed to your children. So you can actually, instead of DNA testing, you can retroviral test somebody to see if he was the dad or was the mom. Um, and so you always have them. This is the structure we talked about. This The HERV, the H is human endogenous retrovirus. They have these terminal repeats that are, they always have them. This is how you can find them. Gag, pull, envelope genes, and there's murine. Um, there's different kinds. So this is how it happened. And, and, it, and when you guys do experiments, sometimes you should pay attention to what you find because back 11 years ago, we were just said, well, let's do some differential display, which is a technique where you, we took mice, controls, we took other mice, we burned them, and then we just did some random PCR and we, we looked to see what we found. And we found that, all right, we had some lights light up after burn injury. So then you have to go through and you cut out these little things and you sequence them. You know, and Kehoe came to me and said, you know what? These are endogenous retroviruses. And they've been turned on in, after response to injury. And I go, I just, well, what's, the, what's that? You know, and, and he says, oh, it's a retrovirus, and you told me the whole story. And so I said, that's cool. Maybe that's why one reason why when you get a massive injury, you may get immunosuppressed. So, well, you know, differential display is just kind of a screening, just like if you do uh, gene chips. You've got to really test and see if you have a response. So we went back to the actual PCR, and again, we found that these things can be turned on different organs in response to a burn injury. The two for mice are leukemia, murine leukemia virus and mouse mammary tumor virus. Now, notice where these, these things are also involved in why some people get cancers and some people don't. Um, and that's where they're named after. And I won't bore you with a lot of the experiments, but we have now several publications show there's variation in the expression of these endogenous retroviruses in response to different burns. You can stimulate with LPS, and we actually have isolated what looks to be like viral particles by uh, electron microscopy. Um, again, upregulation, you can look for them by PCR. Um, you, the way you look for them is you look for these long terminal repeats. Now, I mentioned the LTRs before. They have U3, U5. These things, all retroviruses have this at the beginning and at the end, so you can actually take PCR and you screen for these, and this is how you find retroviruses in the body. Um, so again, more of the same thing. We found different mutations. We found whole viruses, but you can see, again, just like these retrotransposons, this guy has lost its envelope gene, so these things are basically remnants of old infections that have mutated away. Um, this is just an example. We, Kehoe has actually done the in silico work and found lines of evolution in the mice. And I have to have the busy slide, could be the record, but he's cataloged, we now have cataloged literally hundreds of these different retroviruses in mice. Um, you can find whole viruses and parts of viruses in the mice in response to injury. I was telling people last night, 
just an example of a retrovirus activity. Um, retroviruses, you know, to form a bond to get into the membrane of the cell, have to form a syncytium. They have to that membrane binds to the cell. Turns out that the human endogenous retrovirus W is involved in. It's turned on actually in response when the fetus implants into the uterus. And it turns out that that protein is in response to that, uh, in response to that um, virus allows placenta to bind to the fetus, so, or the fetus to bind to the uterus. So we've evolved to use some of these techniques to create some of these large cells. Um, so these are more examples. Um, I won't get too much into details as we move along. We've shown that some of these are proteins and envelope proteins were turned on in response to injury in vitro. Um, again, we found that there's some cytotoxicity in response to the envelope polypeptides. And we've shown that there's a tie to different cytokine activity in response to basically in vitro studies with uh, induction of some of these endogenous retroviruses. Um, again, another example of that. Um, this is just a study Kehoe has done that's shown that some of these viruses actually we can infect into some of the um, non-murine cells, so it may explain why the simian endogenous retrovirus eventually went to the human endogenous retroviruses. So we're starting to look at some of these viruses in response to injury. Um, so these are some of the concluding slides. So how do these viruses work? So this is the structure. They can be a stress signal, can turn this on, it can turn on another gene, which can lead to a pro-inflammatory response. It can uh, lead to viral infection. Um, so many reasons these viruses may be involved, and we don't know enough yet. The other thing we actually have found, too, and this is an example, I don't have the data right here, that and dodge, one of the endogenous retroviruses, or a few of the endogenous retroviruses we found actually could turn on super antigen. Now, what is super antigen? Super antigen is a antigen that turns on the T cell activity without going through the recognition pathway. So we have bacteria that can turn on super antigen. We have viruses that turn on super antigen, which means you don't have to recognize a foreign tissue. Um, so Keogh has found that some of these uh, endogenous retroviruses actually can upregulate superantigen, so we're starting to go down that pathway. Does injury lead to an endogenous retrovirus which turns on a superantigen, which leads to the immunosuppression we see after burn injury? Um, turns out that all of us have infections at different rates. You know, that may be um, endogenous retroviruses as you get infected may lead to a different identity, so identical twins, even though they look a little different they may have different endogenous retroviruses. We may use that concept for identification. So where does this lead us? Well, maybe in the future with stress signals we can say, all right, we know you have endogenous retrovirus. Maybe we need to use some of these antivirals to try to improve the response if we can understand which way do you go. Do you turn on a virus? Do you turn off a virus? Um, does that virus cause an immunosuppression? Can you regulate that process? Can you use siRNAs against them? We don't know. Um, we're, gonna, we're starting now to look at some of our burn patients to see if they have a differential response to uh, endogenous retroviruses. We're looking at it. We're doing some studies now to see if a blood transfusion, do you transfer a retrovirus from the transfused blood into the patient? So some of these studies we're starting to do. Um, the problem with research is the more you learn, the more you have questions you have, and the more of the work there is to do. So, I'm going to close there. Um, Kiho Cho, these are the, some of the key people doing the work. Kiho Cho is an incredible researcher. Um, he's the one who's been kind of getting, especially the retrovirus work done. Um, Kristen Yee did a lot of the work. Um, she's one of our surgical residents. Um, did a lot of the work with the PolyQ. Kelly Tung, another one of our surgical residents, is doing the work with human um, glucocorticoids and a lot of the PhD guys doing a lot of work. Um, this is Please come visit me. This is the Shriners Hospital in uh, um, Sacramento, which is across the street from UC Davis. Uh, we give free care to children throughout North America, so uh, we have to come have you visit us. Our lab is on the sixth floor right here, and I will finish there. Thank you.
Thank you guys. Perfect.